Hello, I'm Stephen Schein. I'm the Chief of Pediatric Critical Care at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. I want to thank VPS for their invitation to speak today, and I want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. I have no financial relationships pertinent to this talk, but I do serve on the VPS Advisory Board. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I want to introduce all of you to how we use the VPS Virtual PICU here at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. And I want to specifically talk about how we use VPS data to drive quality, to drive fiscal accountability, and to drive pride and confidence amongst our staff and our families. As many of you are probably aware, VPS started the virtual PICU in the early 2000s. In 2013, my predecessor, Alex Rhoda, was recruited here to Rainbow to become the division chief. You can see him here in our ICU with one of our many pet pals. Shortly after coming, Alex realized the need to bring VPS here to Rainbow. And over the last eight or so years, we have nearly 14,000 patients worth of data that we've accrued here. And like many of you, we use VPS for a number of things. We use it very commonly for our quality assurance and quality improvement work. We use it to help assess how we're doing with healthcare acquired conditions. Some of these we directly measure v, uh, with VPS, like unplanned extubations. And for other things, we use VPS data to help us establish the denominator. For example, for CLABSIs, we use VPS to measure our number of line days to be able to accurately calculate our rate. We also use VPS to track our patient volumes and our outcomes. And so whenever a provider from a different specialty wants to know how many patients with DKA or seizures that required intubation, we can always get that data quite easily. When we wanna understand how our patients are doing, what their outcomes are, those data are always at our fingertips. And that's invaluable for any number of reasons, including both looking retrospectively and trying to, uh, to plan proactively as well. We, like many of you, also use VPS for research. And this includes single center studies like this one published by Catherine Slane, where we're able to use our VPS data to identify children with bronchiolitis who met the PALIC at risk for PARDS criteria. We're also very fortunate to um, participate in multi-center VPS research. And to me, that, that's one of the most outstanding things um, that we've been able to do through this partnership. And we've been able to, to be a part of a number of, uh, of studies leveraging data from a large number of VPS institutions, including these here, where we're able to identify and describe neurologic and functional morbidity after um, admission with critical bronchiolitis. We're able to derive and validate a critical bronchiolitis score and to do a, um, um, an epidemiologic survey of negative pressure ventilation use in modern PICUs. VPS also enables us to participate in prospective multi-center studies. For example, the Bright Star Collaborative, which we're a member of, um, uh, led by Phil Tulsis, who's one of the intensivists who's also IV trained here at Rainbow. But in terms of specific uses and ways that we use VPS and what I think are some novel ways, there are three things I wanna talk about. The first one of these is how we use VPS to support our morbidity and mortality conference. Like many of you, uh, we have an m, &M conference that we do every other week. Now this is a multidisciplinary conference. We, are, we invite all the PICU attendings and all the PICU faculty, and then leadership from PICU nursing, from our respiratory therapists, social work, pharmacy, nutrition, really all of the disciplines that have a direct role in the daily life of, uh, of our ICU. There, we review all quality issues and concerns and any patient with any significant, significant unfavorable outcomes. Now, a lot of these quality issues and concerns are raised through our institution's PASS system, our patient advocacy and shared stories system, which is our online system for documenting any kind of quality concern, whether it actually reached the patient or just was a near miss. We also identify patients for our m, &M by a secondary review by our Directory of Quality Assurance, Dave Speicher. So Dave gets a list from our VPS team every week for all patients that were cared for in the ICU. So he can then review those patients and not necessarily go through their chart, but he does a really good job of keeping an eye on what's going on in the unit on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is sort of a secondary prompt for bringing up any kind of quality concerns or issues that might've been raised during that last, uh, those last two weeks. But it's certainly possible that, that quality issues or concerns could slip through the cracks. Maybe something was so, um, um, uh, that maybe something was such a big deal that the, the clinical team was quite busy and didn't have the time for a pass report to be put in. And Dave, while he's awesome, is a human and certainly can miss things too. 
So we have some objective criteria that we've come up with that require mandatory review at the M&M conference. One of these is 24 hour readmissions. Now, this is a metric that is tracked by VPS directly uh, and is certainly available to all of us in our annual reports. And I'll admit, I have a little bit of mixed feelings about 24 hour admits. Obviously, uh, having children go to the floor and bounce right back to the ICU is not the greatest use of resources and certainly could be a quality concern. But I sort of view it almost like, um, like extubation failures or you know the, the class, I think, with surgeons taking kids with uh, possible appendicitis to the OR. And if you don't have an occasional 24-hour readmit, you might be holding on to your patients too long. But that's why we review them all in this multidisciplinary conference to know whether or not there was something that we really could have uh, prevented. And one of the things that this has directly led to is uh, a couple of years back, we noticed that we had a few asthmatics within a short time period bounce back as 24-hour readmits. And when we took a deeper dive into that, we found that uh, these children who were on Q2 albuterol were often going an hour, an hour and a half in the ICU because they didn't need an albuterol, getting transferred to the floor, and then the floor team wouldn't see them for another hour, an hour and a half. And so suddenly these kids that were on Q2 were getting Q3, maybe even Q4 albuterol, taking a step backwards, needing to get reintensified and coming back to the ICU. So this directly led to us changing our care practice and always making sure that we give an albuterol kind of uh, for the road before these kids go up to the floor. Another um, objective way that we try to prevent patients from slipping through the cracks is identifying all of the patients that we deem to be emergent transfers. So these are kids that get transferred from the ER to the floor that require intubation within the first hour of PICU care. And this is something that, as you can imagine, is easily tracked through VPS. And so this is another way to identify patients that could have had a quality concern, and maybe not. Maybe that was just the natural history of their disease, and this was a totally appropriate treatment. But obviously, if any patient that requires intubation within the first 60 minutes of showing up in the ICU might have benefited from some better stabilization and certainly is an opportunity to improve care. And as it's been hopefully made clear, both of these are very much directly supported by VPS. One of the other ways that we use VPS to, to drive improvement uh, is through billing reconciliation. Now, I think everyone here on this call realizes that sometimes working in the ICU is like being a juggler and trying to keep many balls up in the air. And sometimes it's like juggling while riding a unicycle. And some days that unicycle is on fire too. And things are just crazy. And you're running from problem to problem and dealing with lots of high acuity, time-sensitive clinical care. And sometimes in those days, finding time to sit down at the computer and write your notes and write your bills doesn't seem like the thing that is the most important. And obviously that's really important because that's kind of how the sausage is made, right? We need to document things in the chart for a number of reasons, including um, so that other physicians and care providers know what's going on for medical legal purposes and for billing too. And obviously I don't think any of us go into medicine just so we can bill patients for our services, but it's an important way to make sure that the lights stay on. So in order to make sure that we weren't missing any billing opportunities, we developed an automated system using Excel and where it takes a billing report from the hospital and a patient report that we developed with the VPS system to reconcile all of our billing. So what I did, what we did, is we built a template uh, that I know is impossible to see on this because it's uh, about 45 columns wide. But what this template has is essentially three main sections. The leftmost section, uh, and I'll go into more details on the next slide, is a list of patients um, from VPS. The rightmost section, is billing data directly from our hospital. And then the middle section uses a couple of different formulas that we developed and iterated over time to reconcile the patients from this section and the billing data from this section. So then every week I get a billing report from, the, from our administrator. I go into VPS where I am going to generate the patient list uh, using this unit census report for billing that I developed that finds all patients who were admitted on or after the first day of that week or patients who were discharged on or after the first day of that week. That then spits out a patient list that looks like this. Uh, this is our list from a couple of weeks ago, though I did change everyone's last names to players on the Mets to uh, help provide their, uh, help, help uh, protect their uh, um, uh, personal, uh, their PHI. Uh, and then we take the billing data. And again, these formulas are kind of, kind of going to reconcile this patient list with this billing data here. So they can see for each of these patients, each on their individual rows with their admission date and their discharge date, whether they were billed from this data here. So for each day of that week, uh, it takes the data and reconciles them to one of three states. 
So for each patient on each day, either they were in the unit and had a bill, in which case they get marked as okay. They were not in the unit, in which case I don't care about them for this particular purpose, or they were in the unit, but did not have a bill, in which case it automatically says they are missing. Now, just because they're missing doesn't mean we actually missed a bill opportunity because there are patients who are in the unit on a calendar day that frankly probably shouldn't be billed. These are patients that are admitted right before midnight or discharged in the middle of the night before rounds the next morning. So these missing ones I go through by hand, um, though the, the, these admission and discharge times are in the spreadsheet. So it's a pretty straightforward and, uh, and uh, efficient process. Um, and then when the ones that are truly missing, I send a quick email to one of my partners and let them know that they you know, wrote a note but forgot to put a bill in. And frankly, the money here adds up real quick. You know, um, Critical care obviously leads to a fair amount of charges on a daily basis. And so when we find even a couple of these on an average week, that's a few thousand dollars, a few thousand dollars a week multiplied by 52 weeks a year. It's really easy to justify participation in VPS um, including all the manpower required to, to do this. The last thing I want to touch on today is how we use VPS data to reinforce good outcomes. So I love being an intensivist, um, and I wouldn't do anything else in the world. But obviously, we have a number of bad days mixed in with a large number of good days. And it's a bit of human nature, I think, to sometimes dwell too much on the negatives. Those patients that have they're in the unit for a long time, that have bad outcomes, that have just just things that tear at your heartstrings. And there's science behind this, that people really tend to retain bad memories more easily than they do good. And it's sometimes really easy to sort of just think about the bad outcomes that we have in our unit and not really pay enough attention to all the good things that we do. Um, and I know from the content of our annual report that we here at Rainbow, we're doing great work, just like you guys are all doing at your institutions as well. And while I share our annual outcomes and the good work we were doing with our team on an annual basis, I really wanted a way for every member of the team to be reminded of the great work that we do every single day. And every time they walk into the unit, be proud of the great care that we provide. So this is the entrance to our unit. And you can see hanging on the wall here, some plaques that we've hung up. And these plaques are based on our VPS data and how our patient outcomes compare to our peer group compared to all the other ECMO programs in the, uh, in, in the network. And so every time that you walk into the unit or walk out, you're reminded that even though you might've had a bad day and you might've had a patient with a really bad outcome that's weighing heavy on you, that you should be proud of all the great work that we do. And even though we're all gonna have our bad days and our bad outcomes, and we're still gonna work really hard to try to minimize those, I hope that this gives everyone that we uh, that works in our unit a sense of pride of all the of all the great work that we do on a day to day basis. Uh, we even put this on cups too, and I think this is important for the people that work in the unit. But I think it goes beyond that too. The parents of all of our patients walk down the same hallway every time they walk into the unit, and walk out of the unit too, and so I think this gives them a sense of confidence in our team and the great work that we provide. Now, we do this based on our SMR um, compared to all the ECMO centers, and we call that patient outcome. But as you're all aware, in the annual report, there's lots of other outcomes and lots of other metrics that are followed. And all of them could be things that you can shout from the rooftops to to tell all of the people that work in your unit and all the people that come to your unit how great that you do. For example, if your unit's great at an unplanned extubation rate, perhaps you can tout that as patient safety or quality of care. If you're in the top percentiles for discharge delay, you're a high efficiency care unit and you should be sharing that. Or what if you're just really busy? You have lots of patients or lots of acuity. You could say that's you have some of the highest care team experience in the entire VPS network. But my point here is that regardless of where you fall on SMR or UE rates or any of this kind of stuff, I'm sure there's at least one or two things in your unit that you are extremely proud of that the VPS data can support that you can use to help make sure that all of the people that work in your unit are proud of the work that they do. They remember how great that they do on a day-to-day -day basis when they've had a bad day and can also help the families and patients that you take care of feel confident in your unit as well. So I want to thank Rochelle Martin and Mary Ann Kurtz, who are our VPS data entries and the, uh, the only reason that we're able to do all this uh, work here. And I want to thank you for all your time. And I'm happy to take any questions when we get to that part of the presentation. Thank you.